Well, good morning, everybody. Really appreciate you being here. It's not the nicest of weather, so thanks for coming. Once we all got out of the limo, you could just feel this whole wave of love come from everybody that was there. I realized that we aren't going to have to live in the backyard anymore. We're going to get our lives back. We're going to have a house to live in. Hey, Betsy, so good to see you again. We worked with a lot of your friends this week. Yes, we did. We've got some surprises for you in store as well. So are you guys ready to move that bus? Yeah! Move that bus! Move that bus! All right, you guys know what to say. Say it with me. Here we go. Bus driver, move that I looked at the house and it was just gorgeous. We couldn't even live in our old house because of the fire and winter was right around the corner and we were living in tents in a trailer. Having this new house, it's such a relief to have somewhere that we can enjoy each other and that my siblings can grow up in and that it's such a beautiful home as well. I mean, that's just like icing on the cake. Good morning. We've been uh, looking for the last a uh, few weeks as at uh, renovations, extreme renovations, and how God has a plan for our lives. And uh, we had looked at that beginning uh, renovation, that plan for trading spaces. Then we had gone on to look last week a little bit about uh, that God has a plan to continue renovation. Once we've made that choice to follow him, that he has a plan to uh, do a, a major construction work, a, a major renovation within our heart. Uh, that is a lifetime of transformation. And this morning, I brought, I'd been talking about training spaces, but my favorite show, uh, I don't watch TV all the time, just so you know, this is not a, this is not going to be a multi-year problem where you're going to have to have an intervention for me. Uh, but the, back then, when, uh, when these shows were very popular, I had, would occasionally sit down and watch, but I would watch Extreme Makeover, Home Edition. And this is from that, where they would come in, find a family that was in deep need, and they would come in to bring transformation uh, by uh, taking away their old house and building something completely new in its place. So much so that uh, you, you wouldn't even recognize it by the end. And much of the show was that transformation, but it always ended this way. Uh, even if it was a multiple episode, uh, episode, they would go and they would finish off with what was called the reveal. And what were the people yelling out there, if you, if you heard them yelling? Move that bus, yes. I'm realizing I had some of our, our, our uh, daughter and her uh, fiancé over yesterday. I'm realizing that they probably haven't even seen these shows. And because uh, I was talking about whose line is it anyway, they had no idea what I was talking about. So I realized that not everyone might be familiar with that phrase, move that bus. But that was, that was always when the reveal was coming. It was the place where they would show the family for the first time what had happened. Because they wouldn't be a part of that process, it would be uh, a shocking reveal. And then the family uh, would begin the process of the reveal. They're, they would often find that uh, they would be sent away to a tropical destination or sometimes Disney. And uh, while they were away for the week, the renovations would be completed. There was a team of people who would work on it. But when they would return, they would come back in a limo, often with uh, darkened windows. And I can't help but imagine that they actually told the family, please look this direction the whole way as they're driving in. There'd be a huge crowd. As you saw there, there was often thousands, hundreds or thousands gathered that had either helped or come from the community to celebrate with the family. And when the family would get out of the limo, the crowd would chant, move that bus, move that bus. They even had them chanting before the family began chanting it. The bus moves and you see the family's reaction. And they always would focus on that, often involving some crying. And then they take you, and I didn't want to spend the morning watching the show. You can do that later. Look it up on YouTube. As they take the family through, they follow them through the house, as the family sees what has been done to this house and how amazing it is. This morning, I've been thinking of that, that idea of the reveal, and I want to look at that topic of the next part of the plan, the extreme makeover, 
uh, the reveal. And we're going to look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 16 to 21. It says, so from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view, though we once regarded Christ in this way. We do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. Uh, the new creation has come. The old is gone. The new is here. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God was making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. As we look this morning into God's word, I'm just going to invite you to pray with me as we as we uh, see what God's word not only had to say to the early church, but to us today. Father, we do thank you that you are the God of transformation, that you are the God who comes in and makes that trade, uh, who brings us righteousness in place of the sin that we have. And Lord, that you are in, involved, that you have come, uh, made your dwelling. Uh, here you are, Emmanuel, God who is with us, but you have become God who is in us that you have sealed us with your Holy Spirit, that you work in our lives, and that we are in process of transformation even today. God, we pray this morning that as we look at uh, your work to bring the good news, the gospel, through us, you've declared us to be ambassadors. That, God, you would not only speak about to us about uh, what you have done before, but what you're doing in our lives today, and what it means to be a part of your church, to be a part of your body in the world. Canada, in our neighborhood, in Riverview, or, or Coverdale, or, or in the surrounding areas. In Jesus Christ, name we pray. Amen. So being a good old school pastor, I'm going to hit three points this morning. First of all, uh, the first thing I want to look at is that the re reveal, and you'll look, and I just want to say, you, if you look at the notes for today, you're going to find, I went crazy. That's not going to happen all the time, but... If you like to write, you're going to have fun this morning. Number one, the reveal isn't just for the recipient of the makeover. It is for the audience. The reveal isn't just for the recipient of the makeover. It is for the audience. Scripture talks about God being in the process of renovating our lives, and the changes that God uh, makes are, have significant impact on our lives. God is in the process of transforming our lives so that we don't always have to have the consequences of our sins, although there are times where God even allows those still through to help shape us. There, God is in the process of transforming our lives to help transform our relationships. When, As God comes in and begins that heart renovation, we begin to see uh, relationships transform. Even relationships that might have felt like they were unsalvageable, sometimes God, in that uh, transformation, makes a way to bring healing with our families, with our neighbors. God even talks about with our enemies that God has a plan in that for transformation. We begin to experience God's peace through the storms of life. I can say as a pastor who's walked through a lot of uh, funerals, through a lot of grieving, there is a difference between grieving with God and without. That there is the comforter who comes alongside of us. Our, our lives begin to grow in qualities uh, like love, joy, peace, kindness, gentleness, self-control. The God begin, God's spirit begins to uh, work his Christ characteristics within our lives over time. And we begin to experience purpose in life. We begin to see not only what God has been up to, but our part of that. And that is good, even when things are hard. But that is not the only reason for the transformation. God has a plan for a reveal. The one thing I really enjoyed about that show is that the family wouldn't have seen what was going on ahead. This is the first time that they would see, but often there would be 
people there are just amazed at the transformation and how it happened uh, over the short period of time uh, that they were working. And that reveal was for the audience as well. That reveal was for those who would come along and see, and for the audience who was on TV, you would often be sitting there going, oh, Lord, that's so beautiful. And uh, if you, you know, your spouse was alongside of you, they might be going, hey, I really like that. We should do that. That's great. No, dear, we're not going to build a fish tank under my bed. That's not going to happen. And Jesus talks about that as being a part of the plan that we, he would set, that we would be his ambassadors. In fact, he talks about it in other ways. In Matthew chapter 5, verses 13 to 16, uh, if you, my first uh, Sunday here where uh, we were dealing with the call, one of the verses I refer to is that idea of being salt and light. And, yeah, Jesus doesn't say you are like salt and light. He says this, this is what you are. You are salt. You are light. As the church, we are those things. It's our role. We are to be not only preservatives in our world, but to be light, to be people who reveal God. Others should see our transformed dwelling and say, I wish my house was like that. When I came to Christ, that's what happened. I began to see people who weren't even coming to tell me I needed to change the sin in my life. But I kept seeing something completely different. I knew that I was missing it. One of the things that I have always appreciated about that show is that during the reveal, the family gets to meet the designers, the people who worked, the creative people uh, who've been in there planning a little, a little elements like that idea of you know having the kids, the kids who really like fish, putting a fish tank under their bed. I don't know long term if that's a great idea, but it looked really cool. Uh, outdoors, kids that like the outdoors, they might uh, put in their room uh, ropes hanging from the ceiling and, uh, you know, a, a replica of a tree somewhere for the kids to sw swing on. There was all kinds of elements and touches of the designer. The reveal is not only for the recipients and for the audience. The reveal also al allows others to meet the designer. Our, our key responsibility as the church is to be uh, the path for people to actually meet the designer, to reveal the designer in the design in our life. When people tour your life, do they get to see elements of the designer? 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19 talks about this. It says, do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. The, the Bible talks about this, the Holy Spirit being within us and, and that, that being a mark, a seal on our lives as believers, but it also is the transforming power in our lives. When we talk about sharing Jesus with others, we're not really talking about being intelligent enough or clever enough, being wise enough, and we're talking about having God's Spirit working through us as we encounter others and being open enough and available enough for that to happen. Anyone ever read the Chronicles of Narnia? Okay, good. A number of you, if you haven't, and uh, your parents haven't read it to you yet, or you haven't read it, it's an amazing uh, series by a gentleman by C the name C.S. Lewis. And it's in the church library. You don't even have to buy it. You can go and pick it up today. Right after church. It's there. It is an amazing series. I remember reading it with my, uh, with my kids. And uh, in it, there's a lion who represents God. His name is Aslan. And there's a quote that, uh, that Aslan says that has always stuck with me. It says, Aslan, while well, she's talking to one of the children, uh, while well, he's talking to one of the children named Lucy, he says, uh, Lucy looks up and says, Aslan, you're bigger. And Aslan responds, that is because you are older, little one. Not because you are, she says. I am not. But every year you grow, you will find me bigger. And there's this picture of what it means to be in relationship with God, that there is an ongoing transformation. If God is in the process of renovating us, people will begin to see his characteristics within the design. You might say, well, listen, 
I, 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 I don't know God, I haven't known God that long, but God gives us this promise that when we meet him, that that transformation begins. One of the things I've heard people say is, well, I'm, I've been a, when I was first a Christian, that was true, but I don't know about it anymore. I mean, God used to do amazing things in my life. But the things that, that Scripture points to is that there is a constant growth in your life. In fact, when I talk to my, my kids as they've been growing in their relationship with Christ, I said, there have been times, I'm very honest, I said, there have been times in my life where things have kind of, I've tried to keep them still. But at those times, I've always found that I begin to fall back instead of holding still. My life has been really filled with moments of pushing closer to God or just gradually fading back. And God's plan for us is never to be just holding still. It's always to be about growth. It doesn't matter if you're 18 or 80 years old. God has a plan for transformation. And it's not just about you. It's because in that transformation, people meet him. People encounter him. They see that life within you, and it speaks to other people about who he is. So the reveal is for the audience, not just for the person it's happening, happening to. It's so others might actually meet the designer, that they might see elements of his design in our lives. And I was talked already about in previous weeks that it's not about how good you are. In fact, it's about God working how good he is within you. Being honest about our weaknesses is, probably, is much clear, makes God much more clearly known by saying that we need to depend on him. There's times in my life that I thought that I had to be strong enough and show how I was powerful as a pastor, that I am a rock. And the truth is, the times God's worked in my life have been the times when I've been like, no, I really have to rely on God because I am not that awesome. But he is. He's incredibly awesome. And the times that things have been really hard is when I find out that God is so much bigger and so much more powerful. So first of all, the reveal isn't just for the audience. It's, it's made so that we can meet the designer, but also that the reveal is intentional. The reveal is intentional. It's a part of the process. Romans chapter 12, verse 1 talks about this. It says, Therefore I urge you, brothers, not. Brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of service. Scripture talks about us as being living sacrifices, which, which is really interesting, because when you think about it, um, it means that we have to be intentional to give our lives over to God. It means that uh, to be the kind of sacrifice that God wants from us, that we have to choose uh, to move on to the altar. But if you've been a Christian at all, you also know that there's another part to that. If you've been a Christian for a number of years, it means you also have to choose not to crawl off the altar. It's usually a process of going, okay, I need to get back on. Right now, I'm kind of going my own way. God, here's this part of my life. And I talked about it uh, last week, about being like doors in our heart, or rooms in our heart, that we have to continually make sure that they are open. When I was younger, I attended Allison Church. And if you are old enough to know, you know that it's now called the Journey Church. But the pastor's still the same. It's Dave Morehouse. And I remember when I was just I was just a young student out of engineering going into ministry and hearing this pastor talk about that he would do anything short of sinning to introduce people to Jesus Christ. That always struck me as an interesting thing because I saw it lived out in his life. He did crazy things to make sure people came to meet Christ. And my friends that I met at that church, they saw life that way. And pretty soon I began to see life that way. In fact, the church began to be marked by this idea that they had a role to be intentional in sharing Christ with their neighbors. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 23 says, I have become all things to all men, so that by all possible means, I might save some. I do all this for the sake of the gospel, that I might share in its blessings. You might remember a while back me talking about this percentages of, of how people come to know Christ. And 
the most recent statistics I've been hearing is that about in our culture today, about 87% of people who come to know Christ do so through friend or family. 87% come through friend or family. That means that there are very low, low, low chances that your neighbors are going to be watching old reruns of Billy Graham and come to know Christ. And if you don't know who Billy Graham is, you're just younger. There's very low chances that people are just going to step into the church looking and find Jesus Christ. Most likely, people will come to know Christ because their neighbors or their family members have intentionally loved them, have day after day built relationships, have cared for them. If One of the questions that I remember Pastor Dave asking is, if your church was removed from your community, what difference would it make? If uh, Lower Coverdale Baptist Church was to disappear today, let's, let's say this was the great snowstorm of 2019, and we, we shouldn't have gone to church today. This is where it is, the center of the storm, and we were gone tomorrow. What differences would it actually make of impact for the gospel in our community? Would people have missed out because we were gone? Have we been intentional? It's, a, I think, a better question when I ask these things is actually to internalize it and say, if I was removed, or if you were removed from your community, what difference would it make? It's a great way to say, am I being intentional? It's a great place to start because everything we're talking about should be practical. What does this look like here? We become a church that understands that when Jesus told us to love our neighbors, he was serious. He actually meant it. Do we even know our neighbors. Now, I know if you've lived here for a long time, probably many of you can go, yes, yes. But I can tell you, honestly, uh, first of all, you need to know my personality. I'm a pastor. I've been a pastor for years. I stand up and talk to groups and go out into places that might be uncomfortable for many of you to talk. Uh, you might would go, I could never do that. Well, that's great, because I can't either. I'm, a, I'm an introvert. And if you know what an introvert is, it means I'm shy and nervous and all of that. But over the years, because I've been a, working as a pastor, I've grown to do those things. And I do them because they're important. But when I go to calm down, like some of you probably go, what would really recharge my, uh, my uh, energy would be to go hang out with some people or go to a party. Mary Beth knows that that is not how I recharge. In fact, going for a walk alone is a recharging time for me. I am an introvert. Yes, you can, as long as you're not so close that I feel like you're walking with me. You would have to be like 100 feet behind. Just me and God doing our little thing. Uh, but I have neighbors. Uh, the place I'm living right now is a duplex. We're renting a, a duplex. And I don't know my neighbors yet. But one of the things as I've been preparing for this, I've just been saying, well, I might not be there long, but I should probably get to know my neighbors. My wife already knows my neighbors' names, uh, which is great. It's one of the things I love about her. But this week, I will intentionally go and meet my neighbor. I'm going to go over and knock on their door and say, hello, I'm Jody, or Pastor Jody, if they've heard. And, uh, and just introduce myself and probably drop over a treat because... I should be intentional to meet them. If I don't, I'll, I can go for years and live in my own box. As a church, we could do that as well. But we need to be intentional. Do you, are you intentional in your workplace, in your school, in your, amongst your neighbors, in getting to know people? There are so many people around us that Jesus loves. Have we gotten to know them? If people didn't love me that way, I wouldn't know Jesus today. It's important that we do. This, this week, I was thinking about finishing off this process of uh, God's plan for us and God's transforming work in our lives and coming to the reveal. And I, I thought, if we're going to end there in that series, then I want to end with action. This is what I'm going to encourage you to do. It's been on my heart for so such a long time that we as a church actually care for people. One of the best things, I was talking to Alex a while back, and I said, Alex, what, is, what do you really enjoy? Like, what's one ministry here that's unique or interesting? Because I, I need to find out what's going on. And uh, 
I had already made my decision on one that had kind of struck me as like, oh, I've never seen that done that. That's really interesting. He goes, well, there's this meal ministry that uh, was announced this morning. And if you don't like to read, you can talk to Lauren about it uh, uh, here. But uh, this idea of meals that are made to drop off to people who are in need, and to our neighbors. And I thought, my word, if the church here at Lower Coverdale Baptist Church was to do that not only for those who are hurting within our walls, but just take the time to say, introduce yourself to your neighbors. Take one of those meals. There'll be more pretty soon. I think they're making more. To go meet our neighbors. To love them. To be intentional about building relationships. Imagine what God could do. Not everyone will come to know Christ. But can you imagine the sum that might? They, if they do, it will probably be through you or a family member who has loved them. That's what God's called us to. I just want to pray for us this week. All this stuff that God's doing comes with a mission. To allow God to continue to work in our lives, to be available, but also to be reaching out. This week, if you don't know your neighbor who's right beside you, here's my challenge. Do what I'm going to do. It's going to be, I'm going to be embarrassed. I'll be flushed. But I'm going to go over and talk to my neighbor. I might even bring, uh, I don't think there's enough of those meals left, but I'll bring a treat as well. Maybe cookies that I didn't make. Uh, so, right, dear? I don't bake. I could make the mistake. It would be a really good steak, but it will not be that. But I'm going to go over this week. And if you don't know your neighbor, do that. If you do know your neighbors, uh, and maybe they don't go to church and they don't know Christ, uh, maybe reconnect them. This would be the chance to say, I was just thinking about you, and I wanted to stop by and just say hi, or invite you over for a game night or whatever you do, uh, just to, to build relationship. Or maybe you're in a school, maybe you're a student, and there is someone in your class that you have, God's been speaking to you about connecting with. I encourage you to do that this week. Or if you're in your workplace, there's someone that God's been laying on your heart. Do that this week. Does that sound like a reasonable challenge? I'm going to pray for us this morning that simply God, we would do what God's talked about. We would love our neighbors. That we would reach out and uh, see and ask God to show us who it is this week that uh, He wants us to connect with. Will you pray with me? Father, we thank you for your incredible love how it has made the difference in our lives. Lord, how you desire to transform us day by day. That you've actually given us your spirit so that we can experience real life and transformation. God, we pray that our lives, would this transformation that you are doing would not only be for ourselves, that others would get to see it. God, there are, there are so many people around us that you love that, don't know, that do not know you. They might even be our neighbors next door. Maybe they're our neighbors at work or school. We just pray this week that you would do one thing in our lives. Show us um, show us who that is. Help us to take that and put it into action. And God, uh, not to forget about it. In Jesus Christ's name, we thank you for the way that you work through others in our lives. We pray you work through us as well. Amen.